truth is stranger than fiction. Old saying. Having had occasion lately in the course of some oriental investigations to consult the quote unquote, tell me now, is it or not? A work which, like the Zohar of Simeon Jokides, is scarcely known at all. Even in Europe, which has never been quoted to my knowledge by any American, if we accept perhaps the author of the quote unquote curiosities of American literature, having had occasion, I say, to turn over some pages of the first mentioned very remarkable work, I was not a little astonished to discover that the literary, literary world has been hitherto been strangely in error respecting the fate of the vizier's daughter, Shirazade, as that fate depicted in the Arabian Nights, and that the denouement there given, if not altogether inaccurate as, as far as it goes, is at least to blame in not having gone very much farther. For full information on this interesting topic, I must refer to the inquisitive reader to the Is It or Not itself. But in the meantime, I shall be pardoned for giving a summary of what I there discovered. It will be remembered that in the usual versions of the tales, a certain monarch, having a cause to be jealous of his queen, not only puts her to death, but makes a vow by his beard and his prop, the prophet to espouse each night the most beautiful maiden in his dominions and the next morning to deliver her up to the executioner. Having fulfilled this vow for many years to the letter and with a religious punctuality and method that conferred great credit upon him as a man of devout feeling in an excellent sense, he was interrupted one afternoon, no doubt at his prayers, by a visit from this grand vizier to whose daughter it appears there had an idea. Occurred an idea. Her name was Sherazade, and her idea was that she would either redeem the land from the depopulating tax upon its beauty, or perish after the approved fashion of all heroines in the attempt. Accordingly, and although we did not find it to be leap year, which makes the sacrifice more meritorious, meritorious. She deputes her father, the Grand Vizier, to make an offer to the king of her land, her hand. This hand the king eagerly accepts. He had intended to take it at all events and had put off the matter from day to day, only through fear of the vizier, but in accepting it now, he gives all parties very distinctly to understand that grand vizier or no grand vizier, he has not the slightest design of giving up one iota of his vow of his, or of his privileges. When therefore the fair Sherazade insisted upon marrying the king, and did actually marry him despite her father's excellent advice not to do anything thing of the kind. When she would and did marry him, I say, willy-nilly, it was with her beautiful black eyes as though thoroughly open to the nature of the case would allow. It seems, however, that this politic damsel, who had been reading Machiavelli and beyond doubt, had a very ingenious little plot in her mind. On the night of the wedding, she contrived upon, I forget what specious pretense, to have her wedding. She contrived to have her sister occupy a, a couch sufficiently near that of the royal pair to admit of easy conversation from bed to bed. A little, and a little before the cock crowing, she took care to awaken the good monarch, her husband, who bore her none the worse will because he intended to wring her neck on the morrow. She managed to wake him, I say, although on account of a capital conscience and an easy 
digestion. He slept well. By the profound interest of a story about a rat and a black cat, I think. Which she was narrating, all in an undertone, of course, to her sister. When the day broke, it so happened this history was not altogether finished, and that Sherazade, in the nature of things, could not finish it just then, since it was high time for her to get up and be bowstrung. A thing very little more pleasant than hanging, only a trifle more genteel. The king's curiosity, however, prevailing, I'm sorry to say, even over his sound religious principles, induced him for this once to postpone the fulfillment of his vow until next morning, for the purpose of the, and with the hope of hearing that night how it fared in the end with the black cat. Black cat, I think it was. And the rat. The night having arrived, however, the Lady Sherazadi not only put the the finishing stroke to the black cat and the rat. The rat was blue. But before her, she well knew what she was about. Found herself deep in the intricacies of a narration having reference, if I'm not altogether mistaken, to a pink horse with green wings that went in a violent manner by clockwork and was wound up with an indigo key with his history, the king was even more profoundly interested than the other, with the other, and as the day broke before its conclusion, notwithstanding all the queen's endeavors to get through it with get through with it in time for the bowstring, there was again no resource to postpone that ceremony as before for twenty-four hours. The next night, there happened a similar incident, accident, and with a similar result, and the next. And again the next, so that in the end the good monarch, having un being unavoidably deprived of all opportunity to keep his vow in during a period of no less than 1,001 nights, either forgets it altogether or by the expression of this time, or gets himself absolved of it in the regular way, or, what is more probable, breaks it outright, as well as the head of his father confessor. At all events, Sherazade, who being lineally descended from Eve, fell heir, perhaps, to the whole seven baskets of talk which the latter lady, we all know, picked up from under the trees of the Garden of Eden. Sherazade, I say, finally triumphed, and the tariff upon beauty was repealed. Now, this conclusion, which is that of the story as we have it upon record, is no doubt excessively proper and pleasant, but, alas, like a great many pleasant things, is more pleasant than true. And I am indebted altogether to the is it or not for the means of correcting the error. Les Mew says a French proverb. Perfect is the enemy of good. And in mentioning that Sherazade had inherited the seven baskets of talk, I should have added that she put them out at compound interest until they amounted to seventy-seven. My dear sister, she said she on the thousand and second night, I quote the language of the is it or not at this point verbatim. My dear sister, said she, now that all this little difficulty about the bowstring has blown over, and that this odious task tax is so happily repealed, I feel that I have been guilty of great indiscretion when withholding from you and the king, who I am sorry to say snores a thing no gentleman would do, the full conclusion of Sinbad the Sailor. This person went through a numerous other and more interesting adventures than those which I related. But the truth is, I felt sleepy on that particular night of their narration, and so was seduced in cutting them short, a grievous piece of misconduct, for which I'd only trust that Allah will forgive me. But yet, even yet, it is not too late to remedy that my 
great neglect. And as soon as I have given the king a pinch or two in order to wake him up so far, that he may stop making that horrible noise, I will forthwith entertain you and, and him, if he pleases, with the sequel of this very remarkable story. Hereupon the sister of Shahrazade, as I have it from is or not, expressed no very particular intensity of no gratification, but the king, having been sufficiently pinched, at length ceased snoring, and finally said, hum, and no, and then who? When the queen, understanding these words, which are no doubt Arabic, to signify that he was all attention, and would do his best not to snore any more, the queen, I say, having arranged these matters to her satisfaction, re-entered thus at once in the history of the Sinbad the Sailor. At length in my old age, these are the words of Sinbad himself, as retailed by Sherazadi, at length in my old age, and after having enjoyed, after enjoying many years of tranquility at home, I became once more possessed of a desire of visiting foreign countries, and one day without acquainting any of my family with my design, I packed up some of my bundles of such merchandise as was most precious and least bulky, and engaging a porter to carry them, went with him down to the seashore to await the arrival of any chance vessel that might convey me out of the kingdom in some region which I had not yet explored. Having deposited the packages upon the sands, we sat down beneath some trees and looked out in the ocean in some hopes of perceiving a ship. But during several hours we saw none whatsoever. At length I fancied that I could hear a singular buzzing or humming sound, and the porter, after listening a while, declared that he could also distinguish it. Presently it grew louder, and then still louder, so that we could have no doubt that the object which caused it was approaching us. At length on the edge of the horizon we discovered a black speck, which rapidly increased in size until we made it out to be a vast monster swimming with a great part of its body above the surface of the sea. It came toward us with inconceivable swiftness, throwing out a huge waves of foam around its breast and illuminating all that part of the sea which, through which it passed with a long line of fire that extended far in the distance. As the thing drew near, we saw it very distinctly. Its length was equal to that, that of the three of the loftiest trees that grow, and was as wide as the great hall of the audience in your palace. O oh, most sublime and munificent of the caliphs, its body, which was unlike that of any of ordinary fishes, was as solid as a rock, and of a jetty blackness throughout all that portion of it which floated above the water, with the exception of a narrow blood-red streak that completely begirdled it. The belly which floated beneath the surface, and of which we could only get a glimpse now and then as the monster rose and fell with the billows, was entirely covered with metallic scales of a color like that of the moon in misty weather. The back was flat and nearly white and from it there extended upwards of six spines, about half the length of the whole body. This horrible creature had no mouth which we could perceive, but, as if to make up for this deficiency, it was provided with at least four score of eyes that protruded from their sockets like those of the, great, of the green dragonfly, and were arranged all around the body in two rows, one above the other and parallel to the blood-red streak, which seemed to answer the purpose of the eyebrow. Two or three of these dreadful eyes which were much larger than the others and had the appearance of solid gold. Although this, the beast approached us, as I have before said, with the great rapidity, the greatest rapidity, it must have moved altogether by necromancy, for it had neither fins like a fish, nor wet feet like a duck, nor wings like the seashell which is blown along in the manner of a vessel, nor yet did it ride itself forward as through the eels. Its head and tail were shaped precisely alike, not only not far from the latter, 
were two small holes that served for nostrils and through which the monster puffed out its thick breath with prodigious violence and with a shrieking disagreeable noise.